And I just realized uh, we were on mute that entire time. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just go backwards and do a reintroduction. Uh, we have uh, our webinar, Drones and Robots Emerging Technology in Your Classroom. Thanks so much, everyone, for, for bearing with us as we are uh, dealing with our technological difficulties. Uh, <laughs> We had uh, Udit Agarwal here who did an introduction, but I'll introduce myself for the purposes of time. Hi, I'm Desmond Martin. I'm a STEM curriculum specialist for uh, Next Wave STEM. Um, you can see my email address is desmond at Next Wave STEM. Uh, I earned a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Michigan. And I've spent my entire career um, working towards empowering students in STEM. Um, I've developed curricula for uh, multiple startups focused on STEM education for students K through 12. And that means that I'll be lending a little bit of my real world expertise in progressing towards uh, STEM outcomes to building students for students and educators. So it's a pleasure to have you on the webinar with us. Um, we're going to be talking about some really, really engaging, really exciting content. So uh, quickly, uh, no, not too quickly, but I just wanted to take a little time to talk about today's agenda for our webinar. Um, first, we'll start with a, a very quick word about Next Wave STEM, who we are and uh, what we do. Um, from there, um, we'll get into the meat of our webinar. Um, and particularly, if you're teaching STEM, robots are a must have. We'll talk about why that's the case. Um, we'll talk about drones. Drones aren't just toys, they're the future of work. And from there, we'll talk about the importance of the next generation science standards, as well as uh, 21st century skills. And from there, I'll actually have a chance to uh, formally introduce uh, our founder, Udit Agarwal, as we talk about the next wave STEM way, our approach to solving issues in uh, STEM education. And um, because we have the chat and the poll, the questions functionality available to us, we'll be answering, asking our questions um, via the chat, and we'll have some time in the Q&A to have your questions uh, addressed at that point. So um, from there, we'll just go ahead and we'll jump in and get started. So at Next Wave STEM, um, we have a particular philosophy that drives what we do. Uh, we believe that the world needs young innovators, so that means that we offer hands-on activities and workshops that are designed to give students confidence as they express their creativity and learn how to fail without fear. Uh, Next Wave STEM also believes that teachers are their students' most valuable resource. Um, so that means that licensed curricula, hands-on training and support, um, those are things that we make available to empower teachers to deliver STEM with confidence and fidelity. Um, if we have one goal, it's introducing students of today to the technologies of tomorrow. So now let's jump right into it. If you're teaching STEM, robots are a must have, not a nice to have, not a, oh, I really am not very interested. I'm kind of on the fence. No, robots are a must have as in absolutely need them. And that's a bold statement, but I'm gonna qualify that statement and talk about why that statement is true. So why are robots integral to STEM? Robots are integral to STEM because when we think about robots, robotics, building and developing robots, what we're thinking about is really using critical class concepts in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Robots are the best platform to bring our learning goals and some of the things that we're even being evaluated on and analyzing in our standards together into a singular learning experience. It's really amazing what that will do for us as we are working with robots. So let's let's take some time and we'll focus on each one of those letters in that STEM acronym. Um, and let's think about science. Um, when we think about science, we understand that science is about the discovery of our natural world. We're learning more about how our world works around us in both the micro and the macro perspective. 
Um, but when we're thinking about science, we're also thinking about application. How is this useful? How is what I learned about my world around me going to apply to make my life better or to solve some problems? And when we think about applications, what we're really teaching our students when we're working through robots and robotics is, how are we using robots now? And how will we use robots in the future? Um, it's, a, it's a critical question to think about the, the future facing perspective of robotics. But even more than that, we're thinking about robots as a learning tool. How can we learn even more about the world around us? Um, we're not just learning, we're learning about learning, which is a, a little meta, but that's something that we wanna press forward in our students as well. So as we are learning, about robots and we're learning about learning, it's really important to think of the way that uh, robotics is going to change that dynamic. Um, it's a really powerful, powerful experience that students can have. So technology. Technology is, is a really exciting opportunity when we think about robotics because we're actually getting hands on with computer science. Um, I love what programs like Hour of Code are doing because we're teaching computer science in these really, really exciting ways, these really engaging ways. Um, but one thing that our coding methodology really doesn't have is the hands on component. Um, we're sitting in front of screens. We have our students sitting in front of screens and working with objects on screen. And yes, they're making and yes, they're being creative, but they're not being hands on. Um, there's a lot of conversation right now about screen time and what kind of effect that has on our students learning. I think part of that conversation is also how we think about screen time and the kind of associations that students make between working on the screen and when those are learning experiences and when those are entertainment experiences and having trouble differentiating between the two. Um, working hands-on with robotics kind of takes that, that component of confusion away. Um, we're seeing the, the payoff of really being hands-on and seeing what our code is doing in 3D in life right in front of us. And it's it's an amazing thing to see not only your code run, but to see the results of your code running. Um, so robots give students a really unique opportunity to see their code in action because of the very definition of what a robot is. It's a machine that works automatically to apply a force to do something. So um, that's really, really exciting for each one of our students. When you think about um, engineering, um, the best way to define an engineering lesson, and I know this is something that teachers, uh, educators can struggle with a little bit, is how we teach engineering. Engineering is, a, is about problem solving. Um, one of the best ways to tell the difference between an engineering project and an art project. In an art project, if we're following instructions and we're following along with the instructor, oftentimes we get a product at the end that looks the same. Everybody's car, everybody's boat, or everybody's radio, or everybody's computer was constructed and looks exactly the same when we get to the very end. We know that we're dealing with engineering because we have things that look completely different. Engineering is about finding a solution. We know that there are, there's more than one way to get to a solution, multiple ways. Um, so that's really important when we think about robotics is that when we're coding, when we're building in certain situations, we're actually giving students multiple ways to get to the end goal, to get to the end outcome of the lesson. It's really, really critical that we give them that opportunity to be, be expressive and be creative in that way. Um, engineering is also amazing because we deal with real life circumstances and situations. In the real world, when we have a problem, we don't have unlimited time and unlimited resources to get it done. Um, and that's something the students have to learn about. You've only got so much time in your class. You've only got so many pieces of your robot that you can work with. There's only so much power. Um, there's only so much that our code might allow us to do that we may need to build on. 
Um, and you have to be creative to solve problems when you have finite resources. Um, robotics allows us to do that as well. And finally, when we think about mathematics, um, there are some concepts and it's it's amazing to think about how math is integrated in almost any subject matter that we cover. Uh, I would say it actually is absolutely integrated into any subject matter that we cover, no matter the discipline. But in STEM, um, in building robotics in particular, we see those math com um, concepts come to the fore. So if I'm programming a robot for movement, there are some things that I'm going to have to be able to communicate in fractions and degree learning. Um, if I'm thinking about programming sensors and um, thinking of conditional statements where there will need to be responses, there's going to have to be compare and contrasting going on. Um, if I'm thinking of numbers and loops and actually learning syntax, there's logic that has to be employed that's mathematical in nature. And we can't avoid those things as we're teaching our students on um, computer science in order to work with the robots. And of course, there's this idea of number sense when we're thinking of our, our, our younger students, um, cardinality even. Um, it's important for them to get a chance to learn these things hands-on with a, a system, the platform that moves and gives immediate feedback. And robots are amazing for that. So now that we've talked about robots, now that we've had the opportunity to see um, how robots are really integral to our classroom from the emerging technology perspective, I want to talk about drones a little bit. And drones are really, really cool because they aren't just toys. They're also the future of work. Yes, that's another really, really bold statement, but I believe that's the true one. And drones are really, really interesting because in drones, we have uh, a particular kind of emerging technology. Why do I call drones a particular form of emerging technology? It's because your students may already be hands-on with drones. Um, it's amazing how many different drones that we see marketed currently as toys that students will have experience with. Um, five, 10, 15 years ago, it was very, very difficult for students to get hands on with an autonomous vehicle, something that flew by itself. Um, it was still pretty niche. Um, today, you can go to a, a local or not so local um, major chain retailer and find a flying drone for $10, $15 really easily. Um, to, for $10 or $15, students are getting the hands-on with this interesting emerging technology. But because the barrier to entry is so low, but in there's also this, this lack of education around a lot of the science and the technological um, ramification of drones, we now have a really, really wide spectrum um, with respect to what people may or may not understand drone technology to be. And, the, and that a lot of that is driven by our media and also by our marketing. On one end of the spectrum, we have um, mention of drones as weapons of war. Um, and that's gone as far back as the early 2000s where we think about drones being used particularly for military application. And at the very, very far end, other end of that spectrum is what I was just talking about, drones as toys. Um, a lot of our students can't imagine the wide, wide, wide um, gulf of applications that exist in between those two. And that's something that we want to really take advantage of when we think about this emerging technology, is that you know something about this technology, but there's so much more that you could know about the applications. And that's where we give a chance to be inspirational and motivational. When you think about inspiration and motivation, um, the exposure to these toys is actually a great chance to be a springboard into some deeper disciplines and into some other really, really exciting careers. Um, the analogy that I like to think and that I like to make is to think of students um, who were working with rockets in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, things that might have been really simple toys were so exciting and so um, and so engaging for them as, as young students. And it was technology that's literally thousands of years old, but the barrier to entry finally got low enough that this became hobbyist. 
Well, those same students who were working with rockets um, in the 50s and 60s went on to be NASA engineers, went on to uh, really found our space program, went further and went to the moon and have gone to Mars. These are foundational to so much of the technology that we use today. Um, so I think about our students now who are using emerging technology, who are flying drones and are using drones in, in ways that are fun, but I, I'm wondering about the kind of ideas that they're having as they're working with these small hobbyist drones and the way that they're going to grow in the places that they're going to push our technological understanding and our understanding of science. Um, it's really exciting to see what all these hobbyists and all these students who are using drones today are going to be thinking of tomorrow. Um, that's extremely exciting for me. So this drone technology is inspiration. It's also motivation to go further and to dig deeper into some other disciplines. Um, particularly when we think about earth science and natural science, for example, um, we see drone application with respect to gathering atmospheric data. Um, we have drone applications when we think of um, exploring locales that are very difficult for human beings to explore, explore whether those are volcanoes. Um, even if we think about non-flying drones, if we think about drones that are um, aqueous, that are doing deep sea exploration, for example, or even extra orbital. We've got the United States has three drones currently on Mars. China has a drone on the moon doing exploration. Um, it's really important to think about these different ways that we can branch from our drone technology into other applications. Um, we have applications at home as well. We think about um, what's going on with the hurricane, now tropical depression, now major storm in the Carolinas, there's drones that are being used to surveil the damage that's being done on the ground there. Um, all these different ways that we're using drones and can teach will go into these, these deeper disciplines that they'll go into. And even when we think about computer science, um, we just don't use drones with the controllers that we fly, but we also need uh, drones from the perspective of understanding the computer science that's working with these really, really difficult disciplines as well. So when we think about this particular technology and using them in our classrooms, um, deeper integration is key. Um, we're thinking about not just how do I manipulate and interact with this technology, we're thinking about how I use this technology. Um, how can I bring in forces um, concepts of force exploration and physics into drone flight. How can I bring in concepts of understanding <coughs> weather and atmosphere into working with the drones? How can I bring in concepts of computer science with working in drones by thinking about autonomous flight? And all those things are really, really important because um, we want to see STEM outcomes later on. We're always thinking about future application. Uh, we're not just learning about this technology just for the technology's sake, but because we understand that the future is and future of work is going to be rooted in large part in these technologies. Um, when we think about construction and we think about actually when we think about technology in um, fields that are really labor intensive today, um, the trajectory of history is always that labor intensive fields are um, being made more efficient by technology all the time. Um, there's 3D printing going on right now in construction, but there's also um, the application of drone technology, not just for severe work, but also for actual construction. Um, right now we think about drones as carrying really small loads, but as we think about those ancillary technologies like batteries becoming better, we're gonna be able to use some drones to do things that human beings aren't able to do as efficiently. Um, from a public safety perspective, we already know that drones have a surveillance capability, a surveillance functionality, but maybe drones are a way to augment what we need with respect to having uh, public safety officials in our streets. There are lots of ethical conversations that need to be had about that particular application. But we understand that's a part of um, the, the future of working that students need to be prepared for and need to be able to negotiate and need the exposure to drone technologies early on so that they can form um, really robust and really useful um, 
understanding and learning so that they can apply later on. I mean, think about integrated technologies. Um, we're thinking also of infrastructure, and that goes in line with uh, this idea of drones being used in construction as well. Um, whether or not that drone is projecting a wireless signal. Um, there are parts of the United States right now that really struggle with receiving consistent high-speed wireless internet. And for the future of learning, for the future of technology, that's completely unacceptable. So we know there are projects right now that have drones that are beaming Wi-Fi down onto the earth. Um, Google has been working on that project for at least the last five years. Um, we know that there are going to be situations where we may use drones to extend uh, Wi-Fi infrastructure out into more rural areas. And we see and we know that that um, the application is going to be used more more and more going into the future for other markets outside the United States as well. And in the big woe moment for me, the thing that drones are going to be used to do, which is uh, the stuff that we would have, would have thought of only as science fiction before, but is now real life application is artificial intelligence mobility. Um, right now, we have access to artificial intelligence. We have it in our digital assistants, whether they're in our phones or in our cars or um, in our household devices, something from Amazon or from Google, maybe what you think of. Um, but what happens if we give that artificial intelligence the ability to move? If we let it go throughout your house or go throughout your hospital or go throughout your school, um, what's the most efficient way to have that movement be defined and designed? Um, how can we design for a use case that will allow that, that digital assistance, that artificial intelligence to be available to us anywhere. Is that something we even want to have happen? Um, drone technology, the understanding of artificial intelligence and actually be, being able to move an object through space is something that's going to come together in a really, really interesting way. Hence the woe at the end of this slide. So now we've had a chance to talk about these two emerging technologies that are fundamental to teaching in our classroom is going to be in the future. Uh, robots and drones. We've talked about why we want them in our classrooms and why our students are going to need them. But I also want to talk about integrating this idea of what we as educators need, um, which is the next generation science standards. And it's really at the heart of our approach to teaching. Um, something I like a lot about the direction that we're going with the next generation science standards is that it's really focused on learning by doing. So when we think about the next generation science standards, um, we're thinking about hands-on priority and how those things come together. Um, as educators, we understand the next generation science standards and what they're trying to analyze and um, concepts taught to our to, taught to our students, but if I could break down the next generation science standards in one word, it's that we're learning science by doing science. Hands-on is at the forefront of everything that's happening in the next generation science standards, and there's all kinds of benefits to that hands-on learning. The benefits that we also want to reap by bringing hands-on learning to emerging technology in our classroom. So when we're learning hands-on, um, we're building in knowledge retention. Um, we read the data, we understand the studies that talk about the kinesthetic um, component to learning, where students, if they can get hands on, if they can move an object through space, they are now got this enhanced ability to uh, retain the subject matter that's being talked about. Um, it's, and we've experienced that ourselves. There's a huge difference between sitting in, in a lecture or sitting in a professional development where we're, we're talking and we're listening. 15 minutes in, we're ready to fall asleep. It's even an issue that we have on webinars like we're doing right now, that we don't have something for you to put your hands on and manipulate to move, which is why there are some of us with fidget spinners right now on the other end of the line. But when we're, when we're hands-on, when we're working, um, we're retaining more. Um, another really, really important component of the hands-on learning is the opportunity to simulate work environments. And what that does is it builds learning and confidence together. 
Now, what do I mean by simulating work experiences? Am I saying that we're going to be putting students in situations that they might experience um, in real world work applications? Yes. Um, you may be working in an assignment where your students are, are now um, doing the work of cartographers when we think about manipulating drones and making maps. Or they may do be doing the work of uh, meteorologists when they're manipulating a robot to take sensors in different spaces over time, or a geologist. All these different fields and applications and all of these expectations um, we can project and create for our students um, in such a way where they're not just learning the concepts, they're not just learning the material, but they're also saying to themselves, okay, if I find myself in this field later on, I have an understanding of what's going on, what's expected of me, of what I want to get. I've done this a little bit before, and now I can do this later on. We're building the confidence that they belong in these fields. Um, Hands-on learning is also excellent because that gives our students the opportunity to make decisions and also use their critical thinking to make decisions. And I always bring this back um, to my own formal education when it comes to being an engineer. Um, the heart of engineering is that you have a problem that you want to solve and there are all kinds of different ways to get to that solution. Well, in order to get to that solution, you're gonna need to do some critical thinking and make some decisions especially if you've got finite time, you've got finite resources, you've got finite materials, you may have man-made constraints around uh, the actual hours in the day that you can work, noise pollution, uh, physical pollution, uh, actual worker safety. These are all factors that we have to weigh and then make some critical decisions about. And it's a lot harder to work through that in the abstract, um, reading a scenario, than it would be to be hands-on with your technology and thinking about the direct result and the direct impact that your decisions may have. Um, that feedback, that hands-on feedback when it comes to decision-making and what that will mean for our lessons and mean for our knowledge retention is, uh, is, is really critical. Um, and if I can make it even more stark, it's one thing to read about a bridge falling down. It's another thing to see your bridge fall down and to see the impact that that has. And I think about that for all, all of our potential civil engineers that might be on the line. Um, to be able to be there and experience and have that visceral response is something that you hold on to even as you're gaining knowledge of the concept. But something that's also really, really um, exciting and engaging um, for our students when we think about hands-on is, is actually the, the instructor experience. A instructor experience is huge. And I, I'll, I'll linger here for a little bit because um, when we think about STEM education, it's amazing to have instructors who either have formal education in the area that they're studying and they're teaching for their students or have had the hands-on opportunity themselves to learn the STEM concept. Um, when we think about some of what we do at Next Wave STEM um, and connecting STEM professionals with our students, which is something I'll talk about a little bit later, um, it makes a huge difference for our students to know that this is a person who's not just an instructor, not just a teacher, but is also doing the application that we've talked about before. This is someone who's had to design bridge. This is someone who's had to write code. This is someone who's, who's built robots and does this professionally. They understand what it takes to matriculate through that process. They know, they understand um, how much math they had to study and what kind of decisions they had to make with their own personal time. They understand the, their own personal passion and why they're, they're motivated to do what they do. Um, they walk the path that I might want to walk myself and they see from the inside only what I see from the outside. So these students have a, a portal, a, a window, to look through when they think about their teachers and uh, what their teachers offer them. There's more credibility, there's a high level of respect, and there's the ability for your teachers not to be just instructors, people who talk to and, and, and give your students content, but also give them even more guidance. Um, that's invaluable. And that can only be done hands-on, mentoring, 
and giving instruction and guidance um, without being hands-on with your subject matter is very, very difficult to do. So when we think about the next generation science standards and hands-on priority that, that brings together, when we think about our primary core concepts and the cross-cutting concepts, um, we're building out on these skills and we're bringing everything together. Hands-on allow, learning allows us to take concepts in science, mathematics, engineering, technology, and have students retain it more, have students have more confidence in their ability to apply it, have students develop in their decision-making ability, and have students actually develop a STEM identity, feeling and knowing that they belong in the space. Um, these are the kinds of attitudes that tracked over time, we know results more STEM outcomes. We know results more students taking advanced um, level courses in high school um, that are applying to programs that are designed to generate STEM outcomes when you think of their undergraduate and graduate educations um, will lead to more people being STEM, STEM professionals, whether that's in the hard sciences or soft sciences. I, I don't like that dichotomy, but um, those are also STEM professionals. Um, they're working in service fields as mathematicians. They're solving our world's problems as engineers. Um, we're building a ladder for students to walk up. And the next generation science standards really help to, to bring um, a base level of content that's a great starting rung. So um, one last thing that I want to talk about are actually 21st century skills. And from the 21st century skills perspective, this is where things get a lot more holistic. Uh, we've been talking about STEM this entire time and the effect of hands-on and emerging technology in classrooms. Um, but that starting point, emerging technology and, and then being hands-on in our classrooms is really helping to drive this goal of making STEM real. And when we think about the 21st century science, the 21st century skills that we're developing in our students, we're, we're nurturing a whole student, not a STEM student, not a liberal arts student, not an engineering student, not a pre-med student, not a pre-law student. We're thinking of a whole student, thinking of ways that our STEM education is diversifying our students' abilities in all of these really, really core areas that make better learners and will eventually make better professionals. Um, and there's lots to unpack here. Um, when we think of 21st century skills, they're divided into to three main topics, learning and innovation, digital literacy, and then the effects on career and life. Um, when you think about learning and innovation, we've already talked about critical thinking and problem solving. That's at the core of everything that students do as engineers. And um, it's skills that they have to practice, not only in engineering, but in their everyday lives as well. Um, when you think about creativity and innovation, once again, um, STEM will blend the science that we have to learn to give us the tool set, will give us the emerging technologies, we're applying our mathematics, and we have to be creative and innovative to solve some of the problems that we're running up with with our students. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about a whole lot is also um, empowering students to be better communicators, um, something that a lots of STEM professionals um, of all stripes, whether they're computer scientists or material engineers or climate scientists, for example, is being able to communicate those ideas, um, not just with confidence, but with clarity. Um, as we're working in our STEM lessons, part of that accountability that we have with our students, the way that we analyze and evaluate is in our students' ability to communicate. Um, so that's something that we're developing in our students. And uh, collaboration is so critically important when we think about um, nurturing a whole student, even from a STEM perspective. Um, there's no emerging technology. There's really even no, at this point, commonplace technology that your students have ever worked with or ever will work with going forward that didn't also require a massive amount of collaboration. Um, there's no single person on the planet that can go out to a quarry, mine all the materials, uh, will then um, refine those materials, uh, design a product, construct the product, ship the product all over the world. There's no single person who can take dirt and stone and sand and give me my laptop computer. 
you have to collaborate. It's always going to be a team effort. It's always going to be uh, the ability to work and exchange ideas. And that's something that STEM allows our students to grow in and learn as well. Um, but that collaboration goes beyond just our STEM learning, but also goes to solving all kinds of problems, be they um, environmental, be they uh, recreational, <laughs> be they uh, vocational, and even po political. Um, collaboration is key. Um, when we think about digital literacy, we're thinking about two particular um, literacies that are important for our students to develop as well information literacy and media literacy. And they're very, very closely related. Um, when we think about information literacy, it's being able to interrogate the purpose and the source of information that they're receiving, whether that's in old or new media or even um, whatever their senses can, can um, bring to them. So understanding the information that's around them, what it's for, what its purpose is for, um, the media literacy may be even more important when we think about building a whole student is to be able to understand the source and the purposes of the messaging that they're getting from other people. So if we understand the purposes of advertising, if we understand the purpose of our communication, are we literate enough when it comes to media usage to understand how social media is designed to influence our thought processes and uh, help us change our decision-making process. Um, how do we build that literacy? In large part is also understanding the technology. Um, these literacies have changed over time because of changing technology. Media literacy is very, very different in the world of Facebook and Twitter, which 15 years ago didn't exist when we think about um, the way that we exchanged media before then. It was TV, um, the radio, um, if we think about the exchange of information, email has done more to critically change the way that we exchange information than maybe any tool that has been invented in the last 200 years. So being literate of how these tools work, what they're for, how they can be used and misused is something that's gonna be critical for our students going forward. And finally, when we think about career and life, we're, we're really thinking of the application, the final outcome that we want to see grown every single student that we might be able to work with and emerging technologies and our, our STEM methodologies but when we think about being hands-on and, and engaging our next generation of science standards helps build these students in these critical areas as well. Um, we need students to be flexible and adaptable. Um, this comes back always to solving our critical problems. Um, things can change very, very quickly. Climate change has happened very, very quickly. Political change has happened very, very quickly, and that's that's by design. Um, um, when we have financial, financial crises like we have in 2008, those are things that we have to be flexible and be adaptable for, not only in our careers, but in our everyday lives. And uh, God forbid that an astronomer looks up and sees a a asteroid heading straight for Earth, something that you might see out of a summer blockbuster, we're going to need our workforce to be flexible and adaptable to solve that problem, or we can see some really, really, really critical outcomes. That example is extreme, but that's what we're talking about when we want to develop students in a workforce that's flexible and adaptable. Um, we're also building students and building a future, future workforce that learns how to take initiative and have self-direction. Um, when we think about the ability to make decisions and to um, be critical thinkers, this is also the ability to think critical, critically about our own personal motivations and um, where we want to go in the future and what problems that we want to solve to really take ownership of that, that direction that we're going for in. Um, and when we think about social and cross-cultural interactions, uh, STEM is awesome because it's made our world smaller. Um, it's a chance for us to interact um, outside of our social bubbles. Um, and we struggle with that in, in particular ways when we think about the ways that our technology has even created echo chambers. But if we can be cognizant and be really attentive to the way that we're programming our technology and what our technology is allowing us to do, we're also being cognizant and um, aware of the ways in which we aren't 
interacting or are interacting across cultures, the ways that those cultures are having impacts on us and eventually the way that those cultural impacts will shift and change our lives going forward. Um, when we're thinking about developing students, we're also thinking about creating students who are productive and accountable. That's something that all of us as educators do in our classrooms each day. Um, we're held accountable for what our students are learning, the content, the concept, that they're learning, them growing in their skills, but we also want them to be productive and accountable towards themselves. And am I learning what I want to learn? Can I take what I'm learning now and apply that to what I want to do later on in life? Do, do I even know whether or not I'm getting what I need? That's where your role as an, as an educator, as a mentor, as someone who's guiding future students is so important because it really builds our students' um, ability to take ownership and to be more productive in what they give to our society as a whole. And finally, there's, there's this idea of leadership and responsibility. Um, the, the core of which being that if I identify a problem, if I identify a place that I want to go or that I want to take my peer group, my school, my community, my city, my country, our world. And if I, if I identify that problem and I find like-minded people who are willing to join me in that mission, that we're able to, to go that direction together, that we're able to solve those problems, that I can put it on me to say that this is not a problem for another team to solve or somebody else to solve. This is on me to solve. And it's on me to reach out to those resources. Um, we want to develop that in our students and their careers and their personal lives. The more people who believe in responsibility and are able to lead and are able even to lead by serving others, um, the better off we'll be as an entire human race. So that's really what we want to talk about. We are, we're, we're building a whole student or we're building a whole student by being hands-on our learning methodologies and uh, learning that expands into all these different areas um, that we want our students to grow in. And a great way to do that is through STEM learning. It's cross-disciplinary, it cuts across concept, concepts, it covers so much. And to do that, we have to be really hands-on and really engage our emerging technologies. So I appreciate you guys so much for letting me share this information with you. Um, we're recording this webinar session, so there's going to be a recording available to everyone afterwards. Uh, don't forget that there is the question functionality in GoToMeeting. So if you've got any questions about anything that I've covered so far, any comments or anything that you want to add, by all means, um, go ahead and use that chat functionality or the question functionality as well. Um, but with that being said, I'm actually going to turn it over to Udit Argawal, who's the founder of Next Wave STEM, to talk a little bit more about our solutions at Next Wave STEM, just our, our more specific approach to solving these problems when it comes to STEM education and what we offer. All right, thank you so much, Desmond, for laying out these really important concepts for our viewers today. Uh, so at Next Wave STEM, it's really important for us to focus on emerging technologies and how to integrate those into the classrooms. Um, that's actually what we're all about. Um, so the way we do it is um, we offer, let me go to the next slide. Um, we have four different programs for, for you guys, uh, for schools that we help implement. And these are all emerging technologies. Uh, first one is airplanes and drones which is designed for kindergarten, first, and second grade students. And then we have three programs that are designed for elementary, middle school, and high school students, which are intro to robotics, coding with drones, and intro to 3D printing. So the way we implement this is we have two different ways we help schools implement this. Uh, first one is um, by providing access to the curriculum and provide hands-on teacher training where teachers get to um, learn each of these technologies um, by going through a hands-on training program as well as you get access to our to the course material and equipment that you would need to uh, bring this bring these courses into your classrooms 
And then we also provide implementation support, making sure that you are set up for success. The second solution we have is where we have our STEM professionals that come in and deliver the curriculum on the uh, topic of your choice that can be offered in school or after school. Um, and then in this, with this solution, we provide all the equipment and material uh, to make this happen at the school. And uh, any questions um, to this point, we'd love to, um, this is one of the final slides. I wanna make sure we have an opportunity to um, answer any questions you may have. Um, as well as um, as far as what Desmond covered, the importance of drones, robotics, the uh, the next generation science standards, the 21st century skills, um, as well as uh, if you're interested in uh, learning what about how um, next wave STEM helps schools implement these emerging technologies. Um, let us know if you have any questions. And then the last final slide um, that I have. Um, is just our information. If you uh, guys need to reach out to us uh, to learn more about our solution, uh, we have worked with uh, help implement these programs to over 40 schools in Chicago. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I have my email address, which is my first name, Udit, U D I T, at nextwavestem.com. Uh, you can reach out directly to me regarding any of your questions from our webinar today um, and any of our solution. With that being said, um, I don't think we have any questions um, that I see pop up here on our end. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time today and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. And uh, thanks again for joining. And we hope to see you soon again for our uh, next webinar that we will uh, email you guys about. So thanks again and have a great day. Bye-bye.